Hi, I'm Marlo from Wild Food UK out on my daily bit of exercise today and I'm going to uh, do a, a different type of video for you today. It's the 13th of April 2020, um, which means that at the moment we're in the middle of the Covid lockdown. 2020, I'm sure, will be known as the year of Covid. I don't know when you guys are watching this though, but I hope you find it useful because I figured I'd do a different type of video today. Normally I find things that I consider really interesting and do a longer video about them in more detail, but I'm going to do a sort of back to basics series over the next few weeks when I get the chance to get out and find places like this um, to help you guys that are stuck in, because uh, most of the things I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes you will find in your gardens if you're lucky enough to have a garden or in any green space or lane like this one which is just around the corner from my house if you're living in a flat in a city at the moment i feel really really sorry for you um, stay strong and we will get through this uh, so anyway let's get started on the plants like i say back to basics and there is nothing more basic for a forager than a dandelion now Dandelions here, they're known as a diuretic, uh, hence the French name, pisson lit. But they are also known as one of the healthiest foods that foragers can go for. Personally, I don't eat them very often because they're quite bitter and I'm reasonably fussy as a forager. But they are one of the healthiest leaves around and you can make them reasonably tasty by blanching them or by another little trick that I know, which is to cut the leaves of the dandelion back and put a pot on top of them to uh, block the sun from the leaves and then they'll come through a little bit lighter and a little bit less bitter uh, full of vitamin a i think they've got more vitamin a than any other green so they're a, a good healthy green with loads of other vitamins in them for you uh, don de leon that's where the name comes from teeth of the lion just in case you didn't know anyway dandelions like I say, a real forager's basic. Don't overlook them. In amongst them, we've got this plant here, which I've done a, a full video on before. This is our common hogweed. And this one will probably feature in almost every one of my back to basics video videos that I do because it really is a stupendous edible as far as I'm concerned in the foraging world um, and it grows almost everywhere that's why it will be in almost every video that I do and this this is kind of your ideal hogweed shoot we treat this like asparagus so just blanch it to soften it up and get rid of these leaves um, and then chuck loads of butter in the pan and you've got a lovely, lovely tasty green. I will say to any of you that have got sensitive skin though, uh, either get someone else to pick it or wear gloves when you pick it because it can give people skin irritation. And the sap, I'm being careful not to get the sap on my skin at the moment because the sap of this plant is phototoxic, which means that if you get it on your skin while you're picking, your skin can burn. Um, it reacts badly with UV radiation or sunlight. So take a bit of care when picking your hogweed, but it's everywhere and it's really tasty. We use it for soups, we use it for stews, we use it as a vegetable. The leaves and the stem have a different flavour, so make up your own recipes with it. That's what we do. Um, anyway, moving on, like I said, I'm going to try and fit quite a lot in. Here we've got a plant in the same family as the hogweed that I've got in my left hand, but you can see this plant, it's much more pinate. Now this is another plant that you will find in almost every hedgerow, anywhere in the country. It's called chervil. Um, it's in the same family and that's the wider carrot family. The carrot family is really interesting for foragers because it has edibles like carrots and hogweed and chervil but it also has some of the most poisonous plants in the northern hemisphere of the planet i've done a whole nother video on hemlock hemlock even and uh, you'll see in that video if you watch it or look it up on the website that it looks almost identical to chervil now chervil has a grassy sort of parsley ish flavor it's not worth the risk as far as i'm concerned with regards to uh, novices picking it because it has some highly poisonous lookalikes. 
The difference between these two is that chervil and the poisonous members of the family have this pinnate leaf structure, which is, as you can see, very feathery. Pinnate means split. So this one's split four times, maybe five. And that's once, twice, three times, four times. So this is a four times pinnate plant, which is different to hogweed because hogweed, when you look at the open leaves, there's just one leaf on either side and you can see that more clearly on the more mature plant. Now hogweed does have a poisonous lookalike, it's giant hogweed, well not a poisonous lookalike but a dangerous lookalike. So watch my videos on giant hogweed as well as hogweed if you're going to pick this, but this is the best thing I've shown you so far. Onwards and upwards we've got this lovely white flower poking through. This is a plant that you find in, again, almost every green space and hedgerow at this time of year. You can see it's got this lovely white flower, which uh, looks like it's got 10 petals, but if you look closer, there's actually only five petals, which are all split halfway down. This is in the cardamine family, and uh, it is an edible plant it's called stitchwort. The only bit of it that I like to eat, though, is the tips and the flowers. They're quite tasty and they adorn my salads at this time of year, but the leaves and the rest of the plant really aren't worth it. It's nice to know it's there though, just to make your salads look pretty. Let's keep going up and see what we can find. We've got ferns here. Now I recommend that all of you guys stay away from ferns um, entirely. People do eat fiddleheads of bracken, um, but they have to be cooked because otherwise they are mildly carcinogenic and the ferns really there's none of them that I personally enjoy eating. Uh, I think most of them are quite toxic and uh, full of silica which isn't good for you. Here's another plant that you're likely to find in every hedgerow. Now this leaf shape is sort of reminiscent of the leaf shape of a buttercup. Um, buttercups have much more, uh, well, much less separated leaves though. Uh, buttercups and the whole buttercup family are worth staying away from. This isn't in the buttercup family though, this is Herb Robert. And uh, it is an edible, but it's absolutely disgusting. So don't go eating your Herb Robert. What we've got behind it, just here, is some dog's mercury. Again, a very common plant. Now this one is poisonous. This one um, is even, I believe, potentially deadly, although I know of no fatal poisonings from dog's mercury. Now, dog's mercury grows in almost every bit of woodland that you will ever go to. The only thing I've ever heard of people mistaking dog's mercury for are uh, little shoots of ground elder. Ground elder is a nice parsley flavoured plant. It has a different leaf system to dog's mercury though. So to rule out that mistake, I'll show you now, dog's mercury has opposing leaves. So they oppose there, they oppose there, they oppose there. Opposing meaning that they're on either side of the stem. Ground elder does not have that leaf system. So really there isn't anything that looks like this that I would eat uh, apart from ground elder when it's nice and young. Moving on and up we have plenty of dock. Uh, there's dock everywhere. Docks are edible. Curly leaf dock is good. Uh, horseradish, which looks very much like dock, is a lovely plant. It is the horseradish that you buy in the shops and it grows in places like this as well. Uh, we do use the roots of burdock, which is a different looking member of this family, but in general dock leaves are uh, not for the kitchen table. They are a good placebo when you have a child who stung themselves though. Um, a little bit further up I did see earlier on some vetch, it's just up there. On the way, here's our goose grass. 
sticky willies, cleavers. Now you'll be surprised to know that cleavers are actually edible. They are obviously quite coarse. These are the things that will stick to almost anything. Um, but the tips early on in the year, early on in spring, like we are now, are perfectly edible. They've got a very bitter flavour, but it's sort of bitter with a kind of almost hint of coffee to my taste buds. Try them for yourself. And the tips of the young stuff are perfectly edible. Um, a little bit further up, here's our vetch that I was talking about. Now, vetch is a, a bit of a complicated one for the forager because there are some poisonous members of the vetch family. Vetch are in the pea family. As you can see here, it's a climber, like a pea. Don't know if the camera can pick up those tendrils there, but you can see there for climbing up other plants. And then it grows uh, a range of different flowers. And the ones that you want to go after as a forager are the ones with purple flowers. That's common vetch mainly. Common vetch is a really tasty pea flavored plant. I happen to know that this is common vetch, even though it's not in flower, because I've been picking from this spot for years. But if you don't know what type of vetch you've got, then you should leave it behind until you find out. And the easiest way to find out what type of vetch it is, is to wait for it to flower. This little tip here, tastes almost just like a pea from the pod. And the flowers of common vetch are my favorite floral addition to a salad from a taste point of view. They really, really are lovely. There's our vetch. Now what we're gonna do is go to the other side of the road. And there were some little yellow flowers down here. If we could come and, you'll have to get close, I think. This is the last knockings of our lesser celandine flowers. Now here's the leaves of your lesser celandine. That spikes a bit of grass, get that out of the way. They get bigger than this and the leaves are eaten but only after being well cooked. Um, the same with the root system of this plant, which is actually more interesting than the leaves. The leaves and the roots, I believe, contain pyrolozidine alkaloids though. That's why you have to cook them. They used to be eaten as a green, but modern science knows better. So if you cook them, you can destroy those alkaloids and you can make the pea-sized roots on, or the pea-sized nodules all over the root systems taste quite nice. After you've boiled them for about 20 minutes, they uh, taste a little bit like tiny little potatoes. And off of every celandine plant, you get about 20 of those little nodules. Now, look how many celandine plants there are around here. Any gardeners amongst you will know this plant because it covers an area early on in spring and then flowers yellow nice and early and then you end up digging them up. <laughs> so what else have we got? Going down Hawthorne. This is a great one for this time of year. Uh, at this time of year, I happily eat the leaves of Hawthorne. They're not the tastiest leaves in the world, but they're not massively bitter. They certainly taste nice when you've got a little bit of a balsamic vinegar dressing on them. A nice sweet dressing goes great with these leaves. And these leaves, when I'm picking wild salads at this time of year, they, they're kind of my lettuce substitute. Now there's two reasons for that. They are abundant, although you do have to watch out for the thorns. And secondly, they're really, really healthy. Uh, any of you that have watched my videos or <laughs> been foraging with me before know that when I cook, I tend to cook with quite a lot of butter. Um, and these leaves have pretty much the most antioxidants in them of any wild leaf in the UK. So I, uh, I use them not only to bulk up my salads for free with tasty greens, but also to help clean out my circulatory system, which, uh, is a good thing. What else do we have coming down here? A very common plant from our green spaces. Right here we have Arum maculatum, or Lords and Ladies, this is the young stuff. And it can grow in amongst your wild garlic, and it can also look very much like common sorrel, which doesn't grow here, but I'll do that in another Back to Basics video soon. The reason it's called Arum maculatum, maculatum means not immaculate. And that's because of these black spots all over the leaves. But you can see 
as you can see on this one in my left hand, they don't always have those black spots. There's also a version of this with white veins or white sort of patterning on the leaves. So that version is also, just like these, not edible. The reason these aren't edible, just let the uh, car go past. that's only happened once but that's one of the benefits of this lockdown is that the roads have been taken over by uh, by the pheasants around here I'm lucky lucky enough to live in rural Hereford during this lockdown um, and uh, yeah the roads are deserted near to where I live which is the way that I'm liking it just now um, but anyway Aram maculatum lords or la lords and ladies or cuckoo pint you might know this as don't eat this because it contains uh, what are called calcium oxalate crystals. Now those are tiny little needle sharp crystals which if you eat these leaves will inflame your mouth quite badly. Uh, a chef friend of mine ate some of this thinking it was sorrel one day and he described it as eating paper cuts which is clearly not a very nice thing to do. So don't mistake this for your sorrel. The way to tell the difference is that the arum has rounded tails as you can see there. If you do find common sorrel, common sorrel has pointed tails. They come to a much more definite point than this. So don't, uh, don't even nibble any arum. It's not a clever thing to do. Just behind the arum, we've got some yarrow, Achillea millifoil. Now millifoil means thousand leaves and you can see why it's uh, got an incredibly pinnate leaf structure. Uh, and Achillea, I think that's partly to do with Achilles. I think he marched, or him and his armies marched with it in their, their shoes, because it's good for your skin. It's uh, the best styptic that we know of, or that I know of in nature. A styptic will help uh, your, your uh, cuts clot and stop bleeding. And it's also, I believe, a mild antiseptic. So this is a good plant for for rubbing onto wounds or for making a poultice out of if you've cut yourself. It also makes really nice tea, but it's not one that I would stick into my salad bag. Um, not unless I was quite desperate. So this is one that you will find again, almost everywhere. Now, lastly, we're gonna finish on a little highlight. Um, Cause just down here, I think you're best zoom in on it. Just down here, we've got the most famous of the April mushrooms, our St. George's mushrooms. And as you can see, they grow in your uh, green spaces where there's grass. Normally, they'll grow in a ring and this ring goes over the other side of this hedgerow. And if you look, if you stand back a little bit, Will, you'll see that the grass where the mushrooms are growing is actually longer than the rest of the grass around. That's because the mushrooms help feed the grass and make it stronger in a way that I haven't got time to explain just now. But St. George's mushrooms are one that we consider safe for novice foragers. And that's because they've got a few key characteristics. First of all, there's not many mushrooms grow in April, full stop. Secondly, they grow in rings in grassland where the grass is uh, promoted by the growth of the mushrooms underground. Thirdly, they are white all over the gills, the stem, and the cap. And if you cut them in half, they are white all the way through. Now, something to note there is that the gills are only tiny. They make up a very small part of the vertical space in the mushroom. This mushroom is mostly flesh. It's not a dark gilled mushroom like the ones that you buy in the shops. Um, and it's not a thin sort of flimsy stemmed mushroom, which you uh, do see around and about. Um, now, normally white all over is a warning sign in the mushroom world. There are lots of highly poisonous white all over mushrooms like the destroying angel for example which is just as poisonous poisonous as the name suggests but most of them do not grow in april and uh, the last thing to me is the most important thing now this mushroom has a very distinctive smell 
it smells of kind of sawdust to, to my nose. People, in books it gets described as a, as a mealy smell, a bit like, you know, sawdust maybe at the bottom of a hamster's cage, which doesn't sound too appealing, but it's a very distinctive smell, which makes this mushroom 100% safe as far as I'm concerned for novice foragers. If you've got those key characteristics, it's white, it's April or early May, it's in grassland, it's stout and fleshy, not hollow or flimsy, and it has a smell of sawdust, then you've got a St George's mushroom. This is a gourmet mushroom that goes for 30 or 40 pounds a kilo, wherever you can find it to buy. It's a mushroom that you find all over French markets um, throughout this time of year, throughout late spring, um, because it's so tasty. It's not a mushroom that I would just fry up though. If you're lucky enough to find your St George's mushrooms, they're uh, an unusual flavour in the mushroom world and just fried up with butter, I don't particularly like them. But what they are fantastic for, and I mean amazing, is for creamy mushroom sauces. It's not difficult, just add some cream and butter whilst you're frying the mushrooms and uh, maybe a tiny bit of mushroom stock, salt and pepper, a bit of onion if you want to early on and you've made a lovely, lovely pasta sauce. That's what the St George's mushrooms are for. Now, uh, lastly, I'm gonna finish on that because that's about as much as I think my cameraman's arms can handle for this little back to basics first video. Um, but lastly, I want to say a few things. So I've uh, got a newborn baby at home. Congratulations to my uh, wife, Rachel. She is an amazing woman and she did amazing things. Um, but what the hospital did for her whilst we were stuck in there for 11 days through quite a, quite a torrid birth experience was even more amazing. I really want to thank the NHS and all the heroes that are working there through this COVID outbreak for everything that they did for me and my wife. And lastly, to all of you guys, uh, I want to say a few things. So first of all, stay safe. Secondly, stay positive. But most importantly, at this time, the best thing you can do is stay away from each other and we'll get through this COVID. Anyway, if you want to find out more, go to www.wildfooduk.com.